Today's episode of D&D and D for Sluts is brought to you by Eldritch Blast Caller. Eldritch Blast Caller, for thirst that only the eternal bond of an uncaring super being can quench. This will make sense in a minute. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. After the Christmas events which did not occur, we head back through town and consider going shopping for some nicer clothes for the ball tonight. We have the moral quandary over Kaisan wearing a cloak of billowing and questions over the average height of a dragonborn and if Rick's disguise with his big anime titties is more or less suspicious given his own stature and questions on how conspicuous we're being. Rick changes his tact, aka his appearance, to look more like the Monopoly man. We all buy some fancy clothes for ourselves but politely point out that Kaisan already has the boots with the fur so he has footwear covered. It's at this point we ask what the dress code is. What about piss elegant? No, that's more you, that's not me. No, I want something that I'm going to feel comfortable and my friends will feel comfortable with. Um, I know, dress tizzy. Oh, that, that's that nice. is nice. That's that's nice. Nice. Juno reaches out to Pia and asks if she knows is there anything about the Grey Whisperer. While that's happening, the group asks a bunch of questions about Eden City's various locations. We ask about the Church of the Forges, which is the church from Moradin, the husband of buff theater god Pelor. Gay rights. Gay rights. Thank you. Who is related to Papa Noel, who we have not met before, despite what you may have heard. We send a message to Tao to check up on him. Hi Tao. I hope everything is going well with you and the family. And I hope the mine is going well. We'll take our money in six months. How long has it been since we last saw Tao? We don't know where we'll be. We'll have to return here at some point. How's Whitewater? How's Maddle? Any significant events? How are the Red Cloaks? Have they unionized yet? Did you find anything else in the mine? Here's 70 other things also to think about. Sincerely, the Dragnatigans. We then go and see Gracie, who we've missed, but we still love her. We buy two diamonds, which are for Kaisen's magic. We also find out about the drugs we bought. The potion, the drugs is called Arcane, and it's spelled with a K, and it's backwards. We've purchased our diamonds and know now what our drugs do, which means it's time to remind everyone, stream art pop on Spotify. We get all our shopping done, and we head to the Kirill Estates in the affluent northeastern part of the city. The estates themselves are surrounded by forests and topiaries. We see hedge mazes of people going in and out, general frivolity happening all around us. Juno and Odeon head into the Ed Hedge Maze and get close to what feels like the centre. Within, they find the statue of an elven woman with a cloak sitting over her shoulders. Odeon investigates and discovers it's a cloak of many fashions, which allows him to alter the appearance of the cloak. He immediately takes it and turns it an aggressive nutmeg. On their way out of the maze, they stumble loudly on two elven ladies making out. And they were roomies. God, they were roommates. One of them is the daughter of King Lucrax, and though, though we have a little bit of a conversation about that, all of us are pretty uncomfortable walking in on two people making out. We smash cut to Kaisan, Lokiana, and Rick getting their cards read. Lokiana goes first and learns that while she's had troubles in the past, she will find love, and her actions will benefit many. If she continues on the path she on, she's on, she will find positivity. If she lets doubt beat her, though, she will not. She gains some bonus health. Rick goes next. She knows he's in disguise immediately, but she tells him there's been a lack of accountability and his new powers will resolve that. There are broken relationships in his past, but these powers may save him. They are, however, unstable and this knowledge can't always be trusted. He gains three uses of holy water. I mean, is wine throwing something that even gets you on a reality show? Kaisen is last. He learns he has trouble with discipline. Challenging the status quo isn't always intended, but the way to challenge the past is to follow it and stick to his beliefs. If he wants to learn of his heritage, he would need to look on his father's side. But ahead, there's change. He learns that dragons can shapeshift, and perhaps what he's looking for isn't in the form he's expecting. A voice in his head says, call me when you need me. (laughs) 
As we leave, the lady gives us a wide creepy grin. There's still people playing dice games similar to poker. We'll play Dungeon Dice Monsters, a game of my own creation. We each take it in turns to draw a dice. So it's just like Duel Monsters. Then we use our dice to summon holographic monsters to the field. So it's just like Duel Monsters. Both opponents are given three hard points, and when they run out, the game is- So it's just like Duel Monsters. Hey, stop it! My game is nothing like Duel Monsters. Prove it then! My game uses dice. Burn the witch! The Dragon Nightingans reunite and play a game. Odeon makes his cloak rainbow. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. Thank you! Rick wins the first round of dice. Kaisen wins the next round. We enter the heart of the key roll estates for the party proper and see several people milling about. Kaisen knows Tadel Keyroll, who is the host of the party. Her husband never talks. And we love to see it. Alyssa notices Juno and Odeon and gives them annoyed looks. I wonder why. Juno and Odeon go to speak to Alyssa and apologise for interrupting her tonsil hockey. She's been learning how to be a leader. She offers to kick Odeon's ass, and Odeon has the weirdest boner over it. Rick has a chat with Camrad, the grumpy dwarf, and he hears of a plague in Cragfall where Rick came from originally, which Rick, it turns out, has forgotten about, and that he's potentially one of the few survivors he offers Rick some advice for surviving the court, that they will eat him alive. Oh my god, cannibals! Yeah, I know, right? The group is divided when Lokiana and Kaisen are caught trying to steal, and are kicked out. The group don't let this hold them back, and they head out to try and find if we can find Judius in the tower. Rick uses Urfix to climb to the top of the tower, and listen in on a conversation between Judius and an unknown woman, and an unknown hooded figure. My lord, I have news for you. The Black Spider is missing. His network shattered. The Frost Collective have taken over Whitewater. This is not the update I hoped for. Nevertheless, the Spider's mission was a fool's errand from the start. Good riddance to him. I have leads. I have intercepted a request from the Fool Worshipper in the East. He wants a man dead. There may be a connection. His group has been causing a stir recently. What group? They call themselves the, the Drag, drag Nanigans. Nanigans. Hey, that's us. And now you know why I have red hair. Long story short, there are some connections to the Black Spider. Judius definitely wants Rick dead, and they're aware of the Drag Nanigans. The hooded figure is unhappy with Judius. He's seen sightings of an old acquaintance of the pair, and they're a pirate somewhere out in the walled waters, and there's some sort of dragon connection. It's all quite vague. The conversation ends and the Drag Nanigans spring to action to intercept Judius before he can escape. Rick disguises himself as a guard and inspects the carriage that Judius is in, and together the team concoct a plan to intercept the wagon. Bokeon and Juno set up a roadblock to stop it, and with the team in position to strike and a trap laid waiting for Judius, that is where we will end the episode.